Um, next up is uh, is Leon Yesen from the Technical University of Denmark. Take it away, Leon. Thank you. Let me know. I mean, as soon as I see your screen, I'll be able to drop off. Yes. I'll just. Um... I'm going to share my Chrome tab, I guess we'll be here. Okay, we good. So I assume that this can be seen. Yes, I can see it. Okay, excellent, good. Okay, uh, welcome to my talk. We're right on time. That's excellent. Uh, my name is uh, Leon Eigersen. Uh, I'm from the health tech department in the bioinformatics section at the Technical University of Denmark. And uh, thank you, Ed, for introducing me. And uh, thank you to the organizers for giving me this uh, opportunity. So just a, a brief disclaimer. Uh, if you did attend my workshop on uh, neural uh, network scenario using TensorFlow via Keras, then some of the stuff that I'm going to talk about now, uh, now may seem familiar, but I hope you can live with that. And uh, there are a few new angles, so it's not completely boring. Okay, so uh, now we have that out of the way, I think we should simply just get uh, to it. So the background for this short uh, data science car, uh, case story is that um, we all know working in the pharma industry that identifying drug candidates is, uh, is really expensive. And uh, performing biochemical uh, assays and screening a lot of candidates in the lab, it's time consuming, you have a lot of lab equipment that you need and consumables, so on and so forth, making it expensive. So in cases where the number of uh, potential candidates uh, are large, then we can actually apply predictive modeling to help prioritize candidates. And if we are able to do that, then we can uh, limit the number of candidates that we actually need to uh, to test and thereby we can really reduce uh, the cost so that's sort of the point of reference for for this uh, small uh, case story here so let's set the scene uh, let's say that you are working as a data scientist in a pharmaceutical company uh, and you've taken delivery of a predictive model which is to be used for candidate prioritization in in the wet lab environment and you find uh, the documentation associated with the uh, with the model that its um, uh, final model was created by expanding a simple model. So we start off with a simple naive baseline model, and from that a more sophisticated, high complex uh, model has high complexity model have been created. And uh, you read further through on uh, in the uh, documentation, and you find some visualiza visualizations quantifying some performance metrics for this uh, final model that you have been uh, delivered. Okay, so uh, for this plot, uh, we're going to talk about three metrics. Uh, MSE is abbreviation of mean squared error. So if that's low, then that's good. PCC, that's Pearson's correlation coefficient. If it's high, then that's good. And the last SCC, that's Spearman's correlation coefficient. And again, high, that's good. So on the right here, you can see two panes. One is called y pred complex, the other is called y pred symbol. So this basically just shows you that if we look at the y pred symbol, then that's the correspondence between what was the actual value in the data that was used for the model and what the model is actually predicting. So the dashed line here being the identity, meaning that if all the dots were on the identity line, then your model would exactly reproduce the data that was used to create the model, okay? So if we look at the symbol model here and the more complex model, we can see that the symbol model is uh, slightly more scattered and also seems to be slightly off with respect to, to the slope. The more complex model um, is more, the 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 predictions here are closer to the actual values from the data and they also fall uh, there and therefore they fall closer on the identity line so if we move to the left uh, lower plot in, in the left lower corner here we see for the mse for the complex model is 0 0.25 uh, 24 sorry remember that lower is better here and for the uh, more simple model is 0.52 for the, the Pearson's correlation coefficient, it's 0.9 for the complex model, 0.77 for the simple model, 0.88 uh, on the Spearman's correlation coefficient, and 0.76 respectively for the complex and simple model. So if we look at this, it basically we can conclude that evidently the complex model that was created uh, in, in, in this delivery, it is able to capture this more subtle information better and more able to reproduce what was actually seen in the data. 
So we move on. It's decided this model should go into, into production and you create a shiny app, you wrap the model nicely. The wet lab uh, scientists can use it very easily. And then you continue with other tasks. But some time goes by and now people start complaining that this model you created for prioritization, they know that because you presented it, that the, the documentation says that it's good and so on and so forth. But they can actually see that when they use it for prioritize their targets, then only very few of these uh, candidates are actually found to be relevant downstream. So that's not good. So what should we do now? So of course, you're worried about this situation. Uh, it could potentially be very expensive. So you communicate this with your boss. Your boss. She authorizes uh, that you actually use a rather large amount of money on creating completely new data, and also that you're allowed to dedicate your specific time on solving this very important task. So that's excellent. Finally, we can actually see if the wet lab scientists are right in their observations, or if somewhere, so somewhere along the line, something went, uh, went wrong. So you receive the new data. So before you move on, what you do is that you uh, look briefly at the original performance plot. And as we said before here, um, we can see that the, uh, the first model that was created, the one that took delivery of, is doing uh, markedly better uh, for the complex versus the simple. In the new uh, model here, it's sort of the other way around. Uh, things are acting a bit odd. Now we see that this was supposed to be lower, the better. Now the complex is doing worse. And again, here, here it was higher, the better. Now the complex is doing worse again. And here again, higher is better. The complex is doing worse again. So you compare these, and then you can see that it's the same models, you know that. And it's the same source of the data used for the initial models. But on all performance parameters, all metrics, now you can see that the simple model is actually outperforming the complex. So what on earth is actually going on? So you decide to go over the, the documentation again, and you find something about some tuning. So you reread these fine prints, and uh, now you can see that apparently there was some hyperparameter used to create the complex model named alpha. And this was tuned to get the best possible work, uh, working model. And they found out, uh, the model producers, that the tuning value of optimal performance was 0.12 but it's not really clear how they tuned this parameter and uh, you decide to take a closer look. So in the pa package of, of um, software that's delivered with the model, you also find this training function. So you decide to say, okay, let's take 0.12 and uh, 0.24 and 0 .40, uh, 0.48, so doubling three values of alpha and see what's actually going on. So now we're looking at this tuning parameter for three different versions of the complex model, one using alpha 0 0.12, 0 0.24 and 0.48. If we look at the plot in the upper left corner, we can see that as alpha, here this is 0.12, this is 0.24, and then this is uh, 0.48. Now we can see that when alpha increases, the performance drops. Remember, this was supposed to be low, this was supposed to be high. So here on the original models, on the original data, as you increase alpha, the performance drops of your model. Now you do the same and look at the new data that was delivered that you paid a lot of money for. And now you can see that it's the other way around. So now you can see that when alpha increases, the performance also increases. Something is up with this alpha parameter. In one case, it's the, the, uh, the direction is in, in one way, and the other case, the direction is uh, in the completely opposite way. Okay, always go to coffee when in doubt. Take a break talk with some colleagues, and that's exactly what you do. You go for a cup of coffee, and you talk with a colleague who talks about this thing called heuristic hyperparameter optimization using cross-validation. You talk back and forth with that and enjoy your coffee. You get the gist of this, and you decided to try it out. But uh, let's just forget about the new data for now, and then work on the old data to really sort of get your understanding of this right before we move on to the new data. So you return to the old case, and then you decide to look uh, further on to this elusive alpha. So the documentation mentions something about alpha being somewhere in B0 and 2, and that's, those are sort of the interval that they've used to take a closer look at, uh, at this alpha and, and optimize it initially to this point I want to uh, value. So what is heuristic hyperparameter optimization using five-fold uh, cross-validation? It's set up like, like so. So the th first thing is that you do, you, on the right here, you can see you create five partitions of your data, partition one, two, three, four, and five. And in this case, you also create 
5k folds. So in the first fold, partition one is the test data. So what you do is that you fit your model on the green training data, and then you predict your y hat values uh, on the on the on the brown test data. And then for the next k fold, you uh, you rotate that. So now the second partition is a test, and one, three, four, and five are the training, and so on and so forth. This is sort of the setup. So you rotate overall data. So for each of the alpha values in this interval that you decide to look on from 0.12 to 2, you increment by 0.01. And then for each partition i uh, in the five partitions that you created, you train the model on these four fifths of the data and then you predict on the ith data set, okay? Then you record these performance metrics for each, each uh, rotation. And then for each value of L alpha, you calculate the mean and the standard error of these um, uh, performance metrics. And this you can use to identify the optimal uh, value for alpha. And then the, the heuristic part is that once you actually optimize uh, this value and you identify it, you get rid of all this partitioning and you just fit your model of all the data using the value that you identified. So let's see how that looks. On the left here, this is the mean squared error. On the middle, you have the Pearson's correlation coefficient. And on the right, you have Spearman's correlation coefficient. So what you can see is that as alpha increases, alpha is on the x axis here. Then you can also see that there are two sets, as I said before, there's the test and the train. Remember, we, we fit on the train and we predict on the test. We can see if we look at the mean squared error here, remember we want that to be low. We can see that on the low values of alpha, the dotted vertical black line here, the dashed line is the 0 0.12 that we used for, for creating the initial model. So the models that were delivered you using this tuning uh, value. And as we go up in alpha, we can see that the mean squared error increases for the training, but for the test, it decreases, okay? So in the middle pane, you can see um, the other way around because here it's the Pearson's correlation coefficient, so high values are good, meaning that initially your model is very close to the training data. You can see you have a Pearson's correlation coefficient of just short of one, whereas on your test data, it's really bad. It's it's below uh, point, it's 0.54-ish. And then as you move up in alpha values on the x-axis, you can see that these two curves, the test and the training curves, they get closer to each other. The gray areas here is the standard error of the mean, as we uh, talked about earlier. And now you can see what happens is that as you increase alpha, the, um, uh, the, the Pearson's correlation coefficient on the training data decreases, and the Pearson's correlation coefficient on the test data increases until they plateau somewhere in between one and two. And you can see that the, the um, uh, observation for Spearman's correlation coefficient is, is similar. So what you can we can use these plots for is to find a value of uh, alpha that we want to proceed with. So basically, you can see here that uh, your original hyperparameter tune alpha uh, uh, equal 0.12 was actually a pretty poor choice. And then using this, look, inspecting the plot that we just went through, we decide to, let's say, uh, alpha should be 1.1. This is where the plateauing starts and we don't really move anywhere in performance. So that seems to be a, a good choice for the value of the hyperparameter. So now we want to see how the model is actually doing. So we have here the original and the new model on original data. So the YPRED complex and the YPRED symbol, that was our initial models. And now we have this new one, YPRED complex new alpha. And as we can see here, this new YPRED complex new alpha with the tune value is actually performing not too good here on the original data, but it's performing comparable with the original uh, Y-Pred simple model that we actually created goes up. The Pearson's correlation
Hey, Leon, it uh, looks like your audio and video seems to be having some issues right now. Um, so why don't you try refreshing? Um, and we can see if that'll work. Leon, if you can hear us. May have dropped totally, yeah. It looks like he dropped, so we'll give him a second to come back. Leon, yeah, if you can just refresh. Um, well, in that case, we're, we are a little bit early, but, um, let's just give them a little bit more time. He's messaging me saying that he can see us. Yeah. See, so yeah, Leon, see if you can, um, request sharing again. There we go. Here he is. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. okay, that was a that was a glitch. Yeah, Let's see if it's getting like, yeah. running again. Looks like the so can you can you please let me know how far along you were before I dropped out? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, why don't you share your screen? I think you're maybe it wasn't too long. And there's uh, there's about three or four minutes left. Okay, can you? So can you see my screen now? Yeah, I think we might have been a slide before that. This one? I think that's one you were on. OK. So I will just continue. OK, so this slide showed that you had your, uh, your, your, your new model on the original data here on the, on the left. And what you can see is that after we tune this alpha uh, hyperparameter, we have a, a new uh, alpha here on the on the green one, and then we have the old Ypred symbol, and then the uh, reddish Ypred complex. And we see on the original data, the Ypred the complex model uh, outperforms uh, the others, whereas both the the new alpha and the old symbol are comparable. Whereas if we move on to the original and new uh, model on the new data, we can see that the performance really decreases for the complex model. The mean squared error goes up, and the uh, the Pearson's correlation coefficient and the Spearman's correlation coefficient goes markedly down from 0.9 to 0.6, uh, roughly. Whereas the others stay roughly on 0.7, uh, so they are, seem to be quite robust and much more stable. So it seems that this complex model actually fails on the new data, whereas the uh, uh, tuned model uh, seems to be comparable to to the original symbol model that we created. Okay, so let's just briefly take a look on what was actually going on. So in this case, this is the data that was used to create the first model that we took delivery on. We have the on the x-axis here, we have the explanatory, just one variable. And on the y-axis, we have the response, again, just one variable. And the black dots here, that's the original data that was used to create the model. And then the red um, curve uh, along the, the, the black dots is the complex model trying to fit the the, the data as close as possible. And then the original simple model, that's the blue one here, and the complex uh, model uh, with the tuned alpha is the green one on the line here. And if we look at the same plot for the new data, now we could see that the red line here is not at all hitting the, the black dots. And the, uh, the, the blue and the green lines, they are converging on the black dash, dash line. So what we can basically see is here that the the dashed line, the black dashed line, because I synthesized this data, that's the original, the, the true data generator. And we can see that the original simple model is performing quite well on this. And also the tuned model is approaching the simple model. So this is sort of the right one. And we can see that with our new tuned alpha, our complex model, which is actually the lowest model, approaches this simple one, which is just a linear uh, uh, ordinary d squares uh, model. And um, the original process you can see here, and in this case, this would have been easy to catch that something was fishy here. But this plot you can make because you have one explanatory, one response. In the case that you have 20, 30, 40, 100, maybe 20,000 explanatory variables, then what will you do? This is really, really important, and it's, it's really an issue. So what was the trap in this short uh, case story? 
overfitting. Overfitting was a trap, and evidently this original alpha equals uh, 1.12, uh, 0.12 was, was overfitting. So the thing is that when we have these modern high-level data science frameworks, which we can create really complicated, really beautiful models in just a few lines of code using, for example, Max Kuhn, he uh, introduced stacks early on, Oscar Kiras, as I've been working a lot with. It's really awesome that they exist, but we also have this trap where you can get caught in creating such a model, uh, a model that is working so well that we forget about this overfitting issue. If we have overfitting, then that will lead to inflated model performance. And this will be non-extrapolatable to unseen data. And it could be really expensive if you put a model into production, which is basically not working. It's working only on your trading data and will never work on unseen data. And this is a really very much concrete real problem. And I see it all the time in scientific literature, unfortunately. So what can you do about it? Here, I showed a brief example on how we can use cross-validation and partitioning of your data to uh, cre create a, a scenario where you can test your own model sort of internally. Ideally, you should have an external set. And in our case, the, the new data that we bought, that's our external set. So you can really see how we're doing. And then when you create your model, remember to be as harsh as possible as you can on the model. Try really hard to make it fall apart. And if you honestly fail on making it fall apart, then there's a really good chance that you have a robust model that you can actually use uh, downstream in, in your data science uh, infrastructure. OK, so just briefly on the acknowledgments. First of all, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the uh, Pharma Organize for inviting me and giving this opportunity. I'd also like to thank the Google TensorFlow team for supporting my research. Um, and I would love, love to thank, uh, thank my, my lovely, excellent uh, colleagues at the Department of Health Technology section of uh, Bioinformatics at Technical University of Denmark. We are lucky enough to, to move around in these beautiful uh, spaces here. Uh, and if you're interested in more bioinformatics, more data science and applied machine learning, then these are my so, uh, social media credentials. And lastly, uh, this presentation can be found uh, and will be continued to, to be found here at this RPOPS uh, website. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, that was it for me. That was excellent as always, Leon. Yeah, really great. Um,